researching the sacred. We are recording today. Um, uh, we're perhaps recording for Ecoversities um, as well as for the podcast, um, All That We Are, which you may know as The Future is Beautiful. We've gone for a, a more neutral and inclusive name <laughs> due, to, due to where we find ourselves in this moment of time and space. And, um, and so we will, be, we will be making a podcast from this conversation. And so just to know that anything that's shared um, is, is being recorded and will be shared. And if, um, if anyone asks questions later on in the conversation, uh, please do introduce yourself and share a bit about you before you ask your question, because it really gives a nicer context as well, especially for people listening on a podcast with, without um, video. So before we start, let's just take a few moments together um, to, to breathe together and to arrive. We are here from many different parts of the world um, in this space today. And so if you would like to close your eyes, um, you may also keep them open. And we will just take these breaths to first let go of whatever it was that we may have been doing before we entered into this Zoom room. And taking a few breaths, acknowledging where you are the feeling of your sitting bones on the chair or the cushion that you're sitting on, the room and space that you are in, and where in the world you are. What may be happening in the spaces in and around you. And now a few more breaths to connect with each other here in this space. To everyone else that has gathered to be part of this conversation. On researching the sacred. can't hear you. And then as you're ready, you can gently open your eyes and come back into the space and um, yeah, just take a moment just to see who else is here in the room. Remember that you can adjust your view as well to gallery view if you want to see more faces. And um, my name is Amisha Gadiali and I'm hosting this session today and also host a podcast called The Future is Beautiful, soon to be all that we are. Um, and we were meant to have four speakers today, so you may have seen that in the lineup. Uh, unfortunately, um, Kerry Facer hasn't been able to join us today, and um, we're hoping that David Abram will join us later on, but um, we, it is currently a mystery. So it's always nice to have a mystery unfolding um, as we gather in this time and space. And so our two speakers that we will be exploring this question with are Sophie Strand and Bayo Akomolafe. Um, you both have offered very, very short bios um, into, into, into this conference and they're so different. I'm not even gonna read them. I think all that we need to know <laughs> is that 
Uh, you are both authors and um, are both souls that are diving deep into so many of the big questions of our time and everything else we need to know will come out through the questions. So welcome Sophie and Bio and welcome to everybody else that is here with us today. The first question that we're going to explore within this theme of researching the sacred is, is, is very simply what, what is the sacred? Um, and so I would like to invite each of you to share some reflections on, on how you would define or how you understand uh, the sacred. Sophie, should we start with you? Sure. And thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm honored to be included in this ecosystem of everyone who's shown up, everyone who was invited, everyone who by their absence also you know, brings us like a magnet into shape. Um, so when I found out about the title of this conversation, I immediately was a little prickled, which is always kind of a good sign. Because um, I can't quite connect with an epistemology framed around our agency, our active search or quest or inquiry into the sacred. The sacred is that to be grasped, to be accumulated, to be understood. How can I pin it down or find it? And I was thinking that, at least in my own situated experience, my approach to the sacred would be to flip the paradigm and to ask, what if the sacred researches you? What does it mean to let your body be the site of multi-species collaboration that does not necessarily contribute to your own aliveness? What does it mean to look at your haunted nervous system, your non-neuronormativity, your illness, your decay and rot as an investigation in process? Um, I think of the sacred as being an interruption in scheduled programming. It's like an inconvenience. It's a category violation. My favorite quote is by this philosopher Gaston Bachelard, and he says, wolves and shells are crueler than stray ones. And I think that the sacred plays by similar set of rules, which is not rules. Um, gods with animal heads are more sacred than human ones. Um, and, you know, I was, I write a lot about Second Temple period Palestine and folkloric oral Judaism and how it was structured around interpreting texts communally and um, reinterpreting these things in an adaptive unfolding way. And I'm particularly interested in how Jesus both walked into that um, ritual practice and also interrupted it in that his parables were they didn't fit into the expected traditional roles of of, of myth and storytelling in scripture at the time period his parables were intentionally combative you know saying the mustard seed is like the kingdom to galilean farmers is like saying that it's like the invasive species that's taking down your agricultural profits that are keeping your family alive as the kingdom and it's present right now um, and so his approach to the sacred was to create a, a container where interruption happens, where people are constantly butting in on each other, um, where the sacred is always a rupture. It's always a leakage. Um, and as someone with a body that is not a unity, where I have connective tissue, where you know my joints sublux, it's those places of friction, those places where I, I do rupture, where I do leak that I feel myself being investigated by the sacred. So that's my like a very initial kind of massaging of that. Um, I'd love to hear what you think of it too, Amisha. Thank you, Sophie. Um, I feel we're gonna go very far off the script of research in this conversation. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, let's let's see how we, how we flow with this. Um, for me, the sacred, it's something that's both soft and powerful. And it's something that I, I, I don't know if I have ever or would ever try and put into words. I, I, I feel it's, it's often the, it's the presence that you can't describe, you know, it's the, it's the unseen that's always there dancing with us. And it's, it's the, it's the how things seem to move and dance and play in ways that are always surprising and you know arresting somehow 
and um yeah somehow beyond words but here we are using our words bio what's alive for you today around this this definition this what is the sacred uh first is my exhaustion with politics as usual and that i vote for sophie strand i vote for sophie strand <laughs> good to see you sister good to see you too i vote for you bio <laughs> I, th I think i think you're pretty sacred i think we're all sacred but thank you it's good to finally be in conversation with sophie and and you again amisha and i greet everyone uh yeah i started with exhaustion uh, the images streaming through the screen of um ukrainians um fighting and um trying to chase back a tyrant they're upsetting <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're scary images and so there's talk in the air of world war three uh three uh, and uh, it just feels we're in bizarre times. And so uh, during these moments, I often turn to poetry, to write and to read. And I read one from W.H. Auden. It's called September 1st, or September 1, 1939. That's the name of the poem. I would invite you to read it. It's the Mark of World War II, when it began. And he writes, waves of anger and fear circulate over the bright and darkened landscapes of the earth, obsessing our private lives. And it, it, it feels that the sense of privacy that modern civilization offered us as its citizens is hollowing out. And we are not, we're no longer as private or as situated or as grounded as this enterprise would have us believe we are. So I feel that Ukraine isn't as far away as we think <laughs> and that this arrangement of peace that the global nation state order is premised upon uh, that came to us at the end of 1945 when World War II ended. I think it has been a war, a war all along that peace has been masquerading or war has been masquerading as peace, this tense and fragile peace. But what has all this got to do with the sacred? For me, the sacred is this tense in between this in-betweenness of things, this incompleteness of things that can stay within the prospects and the smell and the whiff of war, and at the same time, sense of forlorn hope that there is something yet to come, that there is emancipation, freedom, possibly a glimpse of a different kind of peace that might yet be, even in the mist in the womb of the slave ship, even in the mist of this war that is unrolling, um, rolling out. So I think of the sacred as the amniotic incompleteness of things. The idea that the world is never fully capturable, never fully legible or intelligible. Um, and that this idea that the sacred is fugitive maybe god's whispers you know when we expect the thunder the, and the lightning at the top of the mountain mount sinai this idea that that the small and the indescribably little the critters around us sophie speaks a lot about the microbial and the mycorrhizal and the rhizomatic that somewhere within this tenuous, creaturely, fragile path that we're making through the world together, the sacred is at the very tip of this lichenizing pathway 
that we are making together. And maybe that gives me my greatest sense of hope, even as I feel the tremor from Ukraine, that we will not be fully captured in a matter of fascist arrangements that spring from this, from this machine that we call uh, capitalism or modernity, that we will not be fully identified, that I have a right to opacity, that I will not be fully named. And therein lies the sense of the sacred that I'm, I'm in touch with right now. Back to you, Amisha. Thanks, Faye. There's a question here um, to, to bring the conversation into the space of education and um, yeah, and kind of to understand how each of you are researching the sacred in your work, um, in your writing, in your being, and and also how how that relates to the the ways in which the sacred is discussed or has been discussed and researched within academia. Um, so we can just get a sense of like where we're coming from and where we're going and if there's if there's anything that is is shifting and opening there um, and and if academia is the place for these these for this research or or if you're finding it in other ways so if you want to take this one sure and um, also just want to um say thank you bio for bringing up that concept that, you know, you as, as such a spokesperson for Karen Barad definitely have more intimacy with me, <laughs> um, which is that there's no exclusion zone. You know, there's so much, there's so much worry right now about you yeah. know, Chernobyl. And, but the truth is that, you know, just as we're worried that new radioactive material will drift from Chernobyl to us, wherever we are, so are we immediately culpable and entangled with everything that's happening right now, even though we're, you know, flattened into these tiny little people on screens, when the truth is that we are teeming holobionts and bacteria. We can't, you mm -hmm. know, we can't name that with the, our image. We can't become a glyph for that. Um, it's impossible. Um, there's a glitch. You talked about glitches too, that keeps us from yeah. fully representing our microbial mysticism and our culpability. Um, so thank you for grounding me and for bringing up, poems are very good medicine um, because they don't actually pretend to be medicine. They're like, I'm probably not gonna help you. Um, and therein lies the medicine, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, Amisha, uh, thank you for asking about the more practical approach. And the truth is that, you know, I love academia and there's a part of me that loves to win and to learn and to accumulate knowledge. Um, I love creating reading lists and watching lectures and, and feeling like I'm achieving something. But the truth is that I am dying. I have a terminal illness that has no cure. And the main way I research is by being curious and attentive to my breakdown. And the truth is, I think if I hadn't gotten so ill, I would have gone through a straight academic process. But by virtue of complicated improvisational emergencies, that have arrived inside of my body, my research has had to be anarchic. I've had to be in cahoots with animals and with fungi and with medicines that don't work and with accidents and with infections. And so my research, yes, I, you know, I, I, I love to read primary texts and to go down a rabbit hole, to follow my love like a North Star, like moss on the North side of the tree, you know, to see where my love takes me. Um, but also most practically, I need to pay attention to the ways in which I am falling apart. And, and those, those, you know, for example, we're so interested in our own individual aliveness that we forget that our wounding is a portal, is a silhouette that shows us, it directs us out of the human, out of the anthropocentric story. And when I found out that I had connective tissue disease, I realized that my love of fungi was deeply wedded to that. And that if I couldn't fix myself, I could fix the, not fix, or I could devote myself 
to the connective tissue of the soil, to mycorrhizal systems, that maybe there's not a cure for me, but my illness could be a kind of orientation towards a, an entanglement with something else, with another species. So my, my, my answer is yeah, I have lots of exercises. I, I offer most of my work for free. I have lots of exercises about researching your relationship to your more than human kin and opening up those sensory portals. And, and so I offer those, but if I'm being totally honest, I'm, I'm really interested in the way that disabled bodies, terminally ill bodies, abused bodies have become geographies of the sacred and, and places where breakdown has a lot to teach us. So yeah, be my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie, for sharing with us and um, for the way in which you're honoring your own experience um, in, in a greater collective understanding. Can you share with us um, a bit more around how, how you have, in your own journey, found a way to honor the sacred um, with this, this condition that you're, that you're living with and, and with what moves you um, within nature? Hmm. I mean, I think of these, so I've had a lot of events where I've gone into cardiac arrest or anaphylaxis or been so sick that it's like a bottleneck effect, which are these extinction events. You know, there's some climatological pressure whereby most of the species don't make it. But the species that do, this slender offering of species, then boom out to create biodiversity again. But what you can see are these, these winnowing moments where only a couple of species get, get through and get to reproduce and repopulate the earth. And so I've thought of these events in my life as being these, these bottleneck events as actually showing me that the only thing there is is the sacred. <laughs> and the sacred is being closer to Garcia Lorca's duende than anything else. Duende being goblin, being dancing in the wound, being this, this propulsive energy that is creating biodiversity even after extinction events, but maybe it's not the survival of the human. Um, for me, the sacred is really held and nourished by deep time and by this understanding that Evolution is not a climactic experience. Like we, you know, there was no last ape and first human. Like, where do you draw that distinction? There's no la like first Sophie and last Sophie. I'm on the way to becoming something and I should probably be curious about what it is. Um, so I would say that these events, and I think that when I talk to people who've known extraordinary violence or illness, they, they, they have similar experiences, which is when you're, you're paralyzed when you're in bed when you think that every second might be your last you know just a dust mote in the air becomes like god's eye um and you know i'm not pretending like i took that knowledge with me forward after the first time it happened i am hard to teach i am stubborn and i am you know hard to mark hard to hard to evolve so it, it took many many times for me many many bottlenecks for me to realize that the only thing bringing me through was that effervescent anarchic quality of, of, of life, liveliness, non-human liveliness. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Bio, what do you wanna share um, from what Sophie has shared and also um, this question around academia and, and research? What's the question about research, Amisha? Well, there's a, a question of, of just trying to kind of understand, like, how, how do you research the, the sacred? And, and what does that mean to, 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 to research the sacred? And, and can that happen? Does that happen in an academic setting? Or um, does it not, you know, and, and just, yeah, whatever is alive for you around that. I don't know, but I, I, I feel that, that researching the sacred is what I did for most of my life. And I really don't want to do that any longer. <laughs> if the well, sacred is, yeah. Why? If, what? If, the, if the sacred is, well, what I hear in researching the sacred, especially when I take into consideration my Christocentric upbringing, always postponed the sacred. It was 
that the seeker was at the end of the street down the highway. And if I did my work well enough, I would in the by and by arrive and taste of the sacred. I'm much more given to the idea that research is, is, is sacred than, than, to, than to think that I will eventually arrive at it. I want to feel, I want a sense that when my daughter goes into the toilet and asks me to come help her with washing her hands, or when I'm helping Kea with unzipping his pants so he can go to the toilet, that that's a form of research, that, that that's a form of coming to terms with the doability and undoability of a world that exceeds our imaginations. I want to have a sense that we, that even modernity is a yearning, uh, a reaching out, a question, a sort of inquiry that might be tethered to, you might say, the archetype of Baldur, the Norse god, you know, who is quarantined and in lockdown because his mother, Freya, does not want to see him hurt. And so modernity is asking the question and researching thereby, how do I protect the citizen, the individual? How do I coddle and flatten the space so that it's hyper-rational and entirely available for description, explanation, prediction, and control? Um, and I want to also feel that research counters research, that the sacred is not just some holistic core. It's not just some entireable, intelligible notion like justice or love or compassion, that the sacred is yet to come. And that sometimes we are infatuated with images. And I think this is what the academia, um, academic world is. At least this is one of the critiques that I'm given to, that we have become so to speak, and I speak with a royal we here because there's no monolithic thing called the academic world, but it seems we have become, uh, we have become an, an, an economy onto itself so that it's easy nowadays to even speak about entanglement and eco ecology and feminist new materialisms and how to live in a world and thrive in it as long as it gives me tenured, uh, a tenured position, as long as it pushes me up the ladder but it has nothing to do with living and breathing and uh, being swayed by things that exceed me. I feel maybe these times call for a different sense of research, a pedestrian sense of research, a more than human sense of research um, that takes it away from its humanist claws and allows furniture to do research and allows for the fact that the weather is doing research with our bodies, right? And that we are weathering bodies and that these times, you know, are prolific with different forms of indeterminate research. Um, even though that term itself sounds clinical and sterile. Yeah, let me stop there for now. Sophie, anything you want to add in there? Yeah, um, I just love the the animist um, reorientation of research, the the um, the agency, the agential quality of of particles and matter in investigating and changing. Um, something I've been thinking a lot about is about how our very bodies are experiments and investigations into past ecosystems. That evolution happens so slowly over so many thousands of generations that by the time we exist as matter, we're already these um, fossils of lost places and lost relationships. That our hands were developed for grasping trees, our eyes were developed in the, pre the Cambrian age in, in water to see beings mm -hmm. that are now extinct. And to think about our bodies as doing this very we, we are the tools of, of research, but we, it's research that's happening at a scale that we can hardly even comprehend. Um, and I've been thinking lately about how I'm part of an experiment 
and I'm already a failed component of it. And that failure actually mm -hmm. takes me off the hook. Um, yeah, and I'm very inspired by the ways you um, work with failure bio. So that's definitely informed by you. Thank you. Sophie, remember one of our conversations, you, you this is one of our conspiratorial um, sharings. You, you shared with me the, um, the neuroparasitological phenomenon of the um, fungal entity that, <laughs> yeah. right? Ophiocorticeps that unilateralis. Unilateralis yeah. that, that captures the ant um, through sporulation yeah. and then leads the ant astray so that yeah. it bites down on some leaf and dies. And that becomes some kind of you know, extension of that fungal pathogen. Yeah. Right? I've been, I've, that has taken me through, I mean, to multiple rabbit holes. <laughs> Not just to see how it affects ants, but how it affects humans as well, right? That we all are swayed. We are oriented bodies. We're not as erect as we think we are. This is the myth, the hidden codicil of modern civilization, that I stand erect, that my brother here, even, and Aaron, who is uh, here as well, stands erect, you know, independent, resolute, but that we are oriented and moved and instigated and motivated and part of things that are larger than us disturbs the idea that I'm the researcher. Yeah. Yes, and I'm answering my own questions. <laughs> then it becomes an invitation to stay with the trouble that even the ways we ask questions, even the way we desire, even the ways we want, even the ways we articulate hope and think about the future are computational, algorithmic, you know, beyond us, cybernetic flows beyond us. And that is shocking, scary, and hopeful all <laughs> at once. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot in terms of emergence and about how you can't plan for emergence and that in terms of a lot of the climatological things we're predicting, we probably don't actually understand what's going to happen. Um, that the very nature of complexity is that you can't game it. Um, and that we're just a part of it. And um, I've been thinking about how the sacred is an emergency and an emergence and that we jump levels of complex organization, not because we think our way through complexity, but that we relax into the morphological component of these coalescing patterns. Like how can we like feel ourselves as part of a pattern and less part right. of like matter? And you know, it's a very processed philosophy. How can we feel like we're doorways for matter that's flowing through us? And I guess, I mean, I love academia and, and I, I very much um, understand the ways it can contain, you know, life is containment. It is lipid cells that contain life briefly, but then it has to rupture in order to reproduce. And so I think academia needs to cultivate rupture um, mm -hmm. a little bit in order to create those emergent systems that, that help us to improvisationally work with these larger stories, yeah. And maybe this is where play comes in, right? Mm. This is where the playful um, disruption of a child bursting yeah. into the room becomes, um, because planning for rupture also feels like part of the program. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know, exactly. It's like certain right. kind of breakout rooms or things that happen. Yeah, you know, you can't actually do that. I think we can only midwife soft membranes, if you will. Like we can, we can, gather around a crack and, and do something with it that isn't a patching up of the crack. Yeah. We, can, we can lean into the uh, monstrosity of a new ethnography, right? That springs from a crack, that springs from failure. For instance, how do we respond to these moments um, when children are locked up in their homes? What does education mean at this point in time? EJ is my wife, and she was asked this question by two national news dailies here in India. And they were like, so how do you control your kids? How do you keep them busy? And she was like, because this is public knowledge, I think, for, most, yeah. for many people, that my kids haven't gone to school. Um, and she was like, my problem is how to keep them less prolific. 
you know, it's not how to, it's not how to keep them busy. It's how to tame them down. That's what I, that's what, that's what I like to know. So it's the, it, it's, I, I think we're, we're overwhelmed and I like to say diawhelmed, right? We're diagonally influenced by things that are too hard, too powerful for us to contain. And maybe just attracting community around disability, the disability of these moments is the kind of research and education that I'm deeply interested in. Yeah. Um... I love the, the summoning of disability around the cracks and as disability also being a kind of a, a rupture in the body, a crack the in the of body. the human, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and I've been thinking lately that, it, uh, you know, if we think of our very cells of symbiogenesis as being this kind of indigestion, this anarchic lovemaking of two beings that, could, are, that don't completely digest each other or eat each other, but create mm. a new cell, that... Disability is this kind of opening to those incursions that create, you know, ecological novelty. That the, yeah. these our disabled bodies, our cracks, are the invitation to create more complex monsters, as you often yes. um, summon. And that perhaps what we really need to do are create more Frankenstein's right now. Um, allow yes. ourselves to become a limb rather than a mind. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, and, and, and just before we pass it on to um, Amisha, who is about yeah. to kick both of us out of this yeah. place, um, uh, th that disability is never fully owned by the bodies that it's attached to. That yeah. disability is already irretrievably communal, right? Beautiful, and I yeah. Speak, you know, th there's a sense in which my son, who is on the spectrum, um, it's not his disability. That's a property-minded capitalist notion of the body, mm -hmm. right? If yeah. he doesn't own it, it's more an intensity of the field. It's more relational. Yeah. So when he has his so-called meltdowns, which my discipline is, I'm required by my contractual obligation to my disciplines of, of psychology to say it is, but I, which I would not, which I don't subscribe to. When he has a meltdown, so to speak, it's not just his meltdown, it's an intensity you know, of the field. It moves me in different ways. It, it tracks me to different things. It's a different cartography altogether. And I think that is the opportunity. Those places of failure, those places of openings are, are education of a different post-humanist animist kind. The Strandian, Sophie Strandian notion of education, you need to say. I love that, Amisha. <laughs> oh. Honestly, I would never kick either of you out. It is an absolute delight to experience um, the, the connection and the, um, the brain firing <laughs> that is happening in the field between both of you. Um, the questions around academia are, are coming from you know, the, the setting of, the, of reimagining education. And as this conversation is shared wider outside of this setting and um, in the context of the All That We Are community where many people in, in, in that, that community listening, you know, like me, have been out of a formal like educational setting for, for longer than they were in one, you know, and, um, and maybe were quite disengaged in the ones that they were in. And so, there's a, a kind of um, a sort of glaze over that can sort of sometimes happen around the, the the academic conversations, and yet such a hunger for knowledge and such a curiosity mm. for understanding this depth of life in in all the ways that we can. And so, with that, I I wonder what you both can share separately and, and then together feel feel very free to to continue in that way around how we can really live live the sacred or, or live in that um yeah. and researching isn't the right word but but live in that curiosity and in that open um, dynamic relationship with what is sacred and, and how we do that in and amongst both the 
the, the those moments of, of our child's meltdowns and you know the the kind of the day-to-day -day experiences that we have uh, and also within within the bigger frame of for for example what we may be feeling or or what as we are for most of us here watching the pictures of what's happening in the Ukraine for example but obviously we knowing that other brothers and sisters around the world are having a very different experience of that Hmm. Violet, do you want to go? <laughs> you go, my sister. Oh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think a lot about improvisation and comedy and how when you go onto the stage with other people, you want to make the most interesting choice, not the right or the wrong choice. And so you evaluate everything you do in your life as being like, where what's the choice that, I, that I'll make that will provide the most opportunity for relationship and change and risk me being changed. And so I think that it's an interesting way to go about your life, which is every, every decision is an opportunity to risk being changed and to, to risk doing the most interesting thing. Um, and, and just as bio said, that, that doesn't exist in some kind of sanctified church, some realm. It happens when you're going into the washroom to help your child. It happens when you're making your coffee in the morning and you decide that it's your sacred soma and that you're going to have a psychedelic experience by drinking this coffee. You know, there's a lot of, I'm a little worried right now by the psychedelic renaissance and this mm -hmm. idea that everything you take is a medicine. Like, what does it mean to be the medicine? If you look at your, your senses and the way that we've gated them down culturally, if you open up your sensory portals, your body is psychedelic. And I, so that's something I really offer, which is the body is psychedelic. You do not need to take another pill to become ecologically awake. And in fact, if you have to extract and take something to become awake, you're just rearticulating the problem, which is extractive. Um, and so I think for me, in a day-to-day -day way, it's about realizing that everything you do is haptic. It, you know, haptic is the Greek for touch and to fasten. Everything you do touches and also enchains you. And so that you, you know, it was so interesting at the beginning, which is you said like, let's leave everything behind before we enter here, which I think is an incredible way of creating a ritual sacred realm. But the truth is we are sedimented with everything, that we are flavored and salted by everything that comes through us, whether we, as bios say, see it or it diagonally, um, inflects itself upon us. And so I think it's about opening up to all of those ways that our senses allow us to be um, penetrated, sedimented, and changed. Um, and to sometimes risk opening those doorways up even wider. Um, but yeah, I would really love to hear. I feel like Bob is going to have a much better answer than me. I felt a little stumped by that one. I'll be honest. Nope. <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed have. the I enjoyed the frame of of the most interesting that you shared, and I feel like that's uh, I mean obviously that's subjective as to what yeah. is interesting, but to ask oneself in all the small moments and all the big moments, like what is the most interesting choice here? Hmm. Well. Uh... This, this feels like a question of place making for me, how we make home, how we ritualize the everyday, what choices are available. I, don't, I, I hardly ever use that word choice. Um, maybe it's my repudiation of my, of course, my, my upbringing, which I'm still connected to, even though I pretend abandonment sometimes. Um, but choice, how we choose and how we desire, and I feel attracted to the story of, and I tell this all the time, but it needs to be told more often. Um, during my quest to decolonize myself, as if that were an exclusive journey, a linearity through being colonized and arriving at some wokeness, um, I, um, I asked a question. I said, if our gods, Eshu, Obatala, Orumila, you know, if these Orishas, the Yoruba cosmology, the Yoruba mythology, if it's real, if our gods are powerful, 
then why didn't they do anything about those people who came in ships and took millions of us away? Why didn't they do anything about that? Um, and some of the writers that I deeply respect and elders from our place responded with story and would tell the story of um, the God of victory or the God of war, um, Ogun. Um, mounting up an insurgency against the slavers and rushing to the beach with an army and being met on the way by his brother, Eshu. And Eshu comes and drugs his brother and goes and puts him to sleep. And then does the hateful, seemingly hateful and insidious thing of traveling with the slaves, not stopping the whole enterprise, but actually perpetuating it by traveling up and down the Atlantic with the slaves. And I didn't understand this idea. And so another question was born then, um, because the first question wasn't fully articulated or fully answered. It was, so what is more powerful than power? And it seems the streams of and flows virtual and dreamlike are teaching me that, um, What's more powerful than power is ecstasy. Is because power is a form of containment, is a form of colonization. It's an image. It's building an image. It's restoring an image. It's how we take care of ourselves within an image, within a sense of the familiar, right? But it is often the case that the familiar becomes toxic and we need to travel. So Sophie's speaking about ruptures, right? breaking through lipid cells and looking for other transmutational boundaries to explore and differences. It seems to me that the question you ask, Amisha, is really about how we travel and how we hold each other in this traveling, how we hold each other in this time of uncertainty, of rupture, of deep and troubling, failure and dizziness. I must throw in dizziness there. I spoke with a group yesterday and they spoke about pandemic dizziness, that people are falling over. It almost reminds me of the origins of trauma, right? In 19th century Europe, when people started to fall over and they called it railway spine, right? It seems we're back there again at this precipice of things. And we're being invited to make place and make room in different ways. Maybe that's why we're giving ourselves six feet between because something needs to come between. Something needs to be allowed into our ritualized ways of conditioning ourselves to be individuals. Something else needs to be born. And I don't know, I don't know that any of us can fully articulate this moment. All we can do, I think, is to lean in with deep humility. Our practice must be to unlearn mastery. Our practice must be to tell stories, to rejuvenate archives, pedagogies that help us sit here, not pedagogies that rush us into blueprints of the future, right? That teach us to haughtily pronounce what the next might look like, but that we cannot summarily on our own accord summon the sense of humility. One cannot be humble by one own, one's own means. You have to be met and defeated over and over again. So we need pedagogies that help us become defeated and to stay in a sense of defeat or humility where humus is a coming down to earth. I could give a keynote or write a book about this, but let me pass it on. Um, I just wanna honor and say that I felt like that met me where I am today. And the truth is that I came into this meeting having been violently ill for 12 hours and having been in the doctor's mm. office before that. And I come mm. from not knowing how many defeats you can experience and keep going, mm. but also knowing that my most interesting ideas have come from these abyss, these geothermal vents so deep under the ocean that you can't even imagine getting there with the equipment you might need. So thank you. Um, I need to learn how to be defeated and not try and rush through it. Because if I rush through it, it happens again. <laughs> yes. Um, and yes. to be perfectly honest and practical. Yes, feel you. 
I, my best ideas have happened lying on the bathroom floor when the fever breaks. Those are the moments where I feel like it's not that I don't have an ego. It's that my ego gets, it becomes gelatinous. <laughs> it, it suddenly breaks its mold. I mean, it's still corrupted and complicated. It's still present, but at least it can take a new shape. Um, and I think defeat helps us to take new shapes, to learn. And, you know, Somatics tells us that in different shapes, we access different emotions, things we've repressed. And I think that de defeat is a posture, you know, really when you think about supplication, being on the ground, putting your hands out in front of you, that is a somatic geometry. That is a space, a poetics of space we can inhabit where more, more interesting ideas might arrive. Um, right, right. Yeah. Right. So thank you for, for helping to just to root me, to racinate me today, right now. Mm. Um, and I think going to your, your question, which is how, why does it has, did this happen? I think about Job a lot in the story of Job, which is, I feel like in my life, I say, why is this happening? If you're real, if, if my sense of, of, of being in alignment or being in relationship with the sacred is real, why is this happening to me again and again? This feels unfair. And I have mm -hmm. to realize that no, I, I can't understand what posture I'm being put into. I just have to fill the shape. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. Yeah. My sister, the, the story of Job is very central to my ongoing <laughs> thesis and work and musings um, and how to revisit that over and over again. You know, Job crying out, I've led a life by the book. I shouldn't be in this place. I'm a good man. Why is this happening to me? Right. And yeah. And God answers in a way that would banish, if I were to answer as a psychologist, when I was a practicing psychotherapist, if I were to answer a client's questions that way, I would be delicensed, <laughs> right? right? And God is like, yeah, have you seen Pleiades? Have you seen um, Orion? Or have you seen this Leviathan or, or Behemoth? So he, 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 he seems to answer in a bewildering way, which has always, or for some time, inspired me to suggest that maybe, maybe something deeper than an answer to a question is bewilderment. And that what we rudely call reality, which is only a convenience of language, works by the mechanism of bewilderment, works by the mechanism of failure, and defeat. And this is not to romanticize defeat as some magical Disney-esque Hollywoodized you know, thing where there's always a glimpse of tomorrow. No, that's not the idea. But that we live and are inhabited and inhabit categories, right? And those categories, like life forms, help us strive, help us build stabilities. And we need stabilities. We need these arch uh, archetypal architectural structures to know the world in a certain way, to think about how to proceed, to care for those around us. The question is, the universe is too indeterminate, too promiscuous, too teenage to abide by a single form. It will keep on moving. Loss is its language, is the soundtrack of emergence. And so we, it seems stabilities need to give way to different other stabilities. And it's, it is defeat, or what French philosopher Deleuze would call deterritorialization, that would invite a sense of the new or different differences, right? I've been leaning into xenoglossy. Xenoglossy is not something that is, um, you guys may not have heard of it. Uh, xenoglossy is the observed spontaneous acquisition of a new language by those who are autistic, <laughs> right? I've, I've, I've read, this is not something that will make it into nature. Or you know what I'm talking about, Sophie? <laughs> this is a something that will make it into a reputable journal. But the idea that language itself is not human, that we can even say with some, you know, sense of compassion and care, that even if all the people all Yoruba people were to die, God forbid. And, and there were no 
other speakers of the beautiful tongue of Yoruba, that Yoruba will still live in the morsels, you know, in pheromones, in, in molecules, in ants and their communities. It will find a way to be secreted by the other than human. That language is not just us. I'm traipsing off into somewhere else, but uh, I, I, yeah, that's what happens when you allow us to play. There, there is nowhere in particular that we are meant to be playing. We are just here where we are playing with whatever arises. Um, Sophie and Bio, I'm going to open it up in a moment for some questions. And the, these questions may take us anywhere. So before we go there, I wondered if there's anything that either of you want to say to kind of close where, where we have been. Sophie. I just want to honor the bewilderment bio and say that, you know, my work for a long time has been in Gnostic early folkloric Jesus, Rabbi Yeshua, before right, he becomes right. translated through into the very language, speaking of language of his oppressors and deracinated from his ecology and political context. And for me, what seems like a really interesting morsel that appears throughout the Gnostic text, and it's particular in the Gospel of Thomas, is a preoccupation with astonishment, which is, you know, the Beautiful. Gospel of Thomas, it says, we first you seek, then you are troubled. When you are troubled, you will marvel. And so the yeah. entry point into, into a spiritual quest, into an interrogative participatory relationship with the, with the sacred is being troubled and then reaching your marvel. And marvel, of course, is not being this kind of saccharine or pleasurable experience, but being right. through vertiginous, being about being spun, not knowing quite where you are. Um, right. And so I do think that our birthright is this astonishment that I oftentimes think in my own life that I have a very impoverished narrative sensibility about my own life. I have a very impoverished idea about what possibilities are open. And I would like to open up space, like you were saying, like the six feet of space for something better to happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, if I constantly am trying to close the distance and predict what happens, I will never leave that open space that attracts in something more interesting. And so I think Marvel is that six feet of distance. It is that open space between people where something more interesting can happen. Um, yes. Yeah. Marvel Beautiful. and bewilderment. Thank you. Be beautiful. That's a band name, by the way, Marvel and Bewilderment. <laughs> yeah, I really, I really felt moved by that, that description of the six feet of space. And, you know, as you, as you traverse the world right now, there are just arrows everywhere telling you to stay away. You find it, you know, even on the path into a beach restaurant on the coast of Kenya, it will say, remember to socially distance and these arrows are there. There is no part of this world that is without these arrows now. And yet I feel that many of us are, are here at this moment as things have opened up and, you know, I'm in London right now and I was observing yesterday, just it's back on it with a capital O N, you know, and and yet many of us feel that in this space where we've been called into a deeper place with ourselves, that now there is a process of, of understanding what has been shifted and what, what has died and what has, what has come into being that was not there before. And then how to be in relationship with um, coming back out into um, a more loud, time-pressed, more people, more energies, you know. Yeah, and I feel like, I feel like that just gave us some, a, a kind of a, a different way of relating to it. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. and if there's anything that, that comes up for you around, around this time of really this kind of, yeah, how do we step in and embrace all that we've learned? You know, it's so easy in cultures that want you to forget, <laughs> to just right. go back to something that never served you in the first place. And so um, this, this kind of dance, um, as we find ourselves, you know, in, in these capitalist systems, having to do what we have to do, and yet we are changed. Hmm. 
I remember sharing this story with Manish. Um, this was last year when we're in the thick, no, what, we, what year are we in? 2022, okay, in 2020, <laughs> two years ago. Uh, this Indian man from Kerala uh, mounts an altar in response to the pandemic and in celebration or in worship of uh, the Corona goddess, right? <laughs> And it was in the newspapers and it, was, it received just horrible, just responses because everyone felt, no, this is, this is primitive. This is rubbish. We should focus on what the scientists are telling us. Um, and, you know, this, we shouldn't condone these kinds of uh, primitive backwardness or something like that. That was the kind of response. And, and I think it just, that, that just offers a glimpse, a studious glimpse into the reductionisms of our time, right? It's not just a reductionism of climate change to greenhouse gas emissions, it's the reductionism of pandemic, of the pandemic to this infinitesimally small critter, right? It's this, it's the virus. If we can get rid of the virus, we're home free. We're Scots free. Um, and, and that's deeply troubling. That's problematic because it, occludes the conditions that made these realities possible. It pushes them away and focuses on the pixel. It's pixelation, right? Um, and maybe in that sense, the virus is not just a virus. The virus is virus plus. It's virus and then dot, dot, dot. It's virus and then an invitation to stay with the legacies of extractivism. It's the virus and an invitation to notice that the gods never left us behind, that they're hiding in furniture in the ordinary, like James Hillman might say, right? Uh, that the archetypes are all around us. Modernity is the mythology of empty spaces, of the individual in some geometric Euclidean space where there's nothing else that is agential except me, right? Bumping into other beings. Uh, that I must be invited to tolerate. So that's the invitation of our times to not only see the six feet as epidemiological, but to probably see it as spiritual, to see it as the space for experimentation and play. In my writing, I call it Sela, right? Sophie, you, you would know about that um, Hebrew tradition. Um, the jury is still out on what Selah means, but it's the idea um, of a pause, right? Um, when the, the conductor says, riff, you know, in the, in the king's court, says just play up a jazz number, or do something, play with this moment. And I think playing with this moment, bringing in more than the constituents, political constituents that we're used to, um, I think is the invitation of our time to stay with the invisible, be hospitable to monsters. Thank you, Bayo. Sophie, anything you'd like to add before we open up for a question or two? Oh, just riffing on bio, one thing, I was also thinking about how in the original Hebrew um, text, there are um, no vowels and that there's this, this inherent space, this breath that you have to fill mm. as you're reading, you can't, you can't even read, you have to read aloud. So there's always this, this space that you have to breathe into the text because not all the text is ever there. Um, so that's just my, my little riff, just <laughs> continuing this. It could go on all day. I'll be quiet. Thank you. <laughs> Is there anyone that would like to ask a question? I'm just gonna pop onto gallery view. And if you, if you would like to ask a question, you can turn your camera on and wave your hand. Erin, and can you introduce yourself as well? <laughs> oh, it's Erin. Sure. <laughs> the, the only Aaron. one brave enough. Erin. <laughs> Uh, I'm Bio's sister and uh, uh, the godmother of his um, son and here in Oaxaca, Mexico. And uh, I wanted to kind of like pull through um, something that I brought in 
<laughs> Hi, Anasuya. I read through um, the conversations yesterday, uh, which left me, yeah, some questions around the fields of academia and the constrictions that they place. Um, and coming out of one of the sessions yesterday, I was talking to my partner Yeo about this. Um, it, it feels to me like there, there, and it's great to hear you, Sophie, say that you love academia. And like, I just feel like it's important to recognize that there's something that draws many of us into those spaces. Um, and there's lots of interesting conversations and research and experimentation happening, but um, there's something about like the carcerality of the institution itself that, and I mean, I think this is true in, in most industrial complexes too, you know, you have this structure that no matter how innovative what's happening in there um, is, it always will hold it back. It will always prevent itself from being eaten or being terminated or, and so, uh, and it felt like a little, the image that came to me was like a, it was like a shield or a shell that, that's kind of like the ivory tower, the, the things that hold and constrain us no matter how uh, innovative and uh, disruptive we may be. And so my question is like, what do you think about creating other spaces for this kind? And I hate the word research, I don't know. Um, I'm just allergic to it somehow. Um, I'm trying to change my relationship to it and think about it in different ways. And this, this conversation has helped me with that. Um, but what other spaces can we create where, where something truly um, outrageous and awe provoking might happen? Sophie, you wanna go? Sure. Um... I have a really simplistic answer, which is, you know, I've spent a long time trying to understand why the story of a very young Galilean rabbi becomes fetishistically calcified around his murder and then <laughs> co-opted by empire for ecocide and genocide. Um, and what, and could he, if he had been given more time, would he have had more interesting ideas? The one idea that we can kind of still extract from him is that he liked to share food <laughs> and he just that was and his change main water teaching. into wine yeah just king, kingdom meals i mean inside to kind of complicate things inside of academia i studied with a famous um, biblical scholar um, bruce chilton and his big working theory was the only teaching jesus really had was just share food <laughs> and in my own life i think the most anarchic interesting experiences I've had have been about communal food sharing, food sharing about food that you grew in your area, wild crafted food, food. We are constituted by hunger. Our cells were created by this act of like aborted hunger. I think our hunger and our desires and our appetites can actually create a ferment where interesting things can sprout. We don't always have to create complicated fancy containers. Invite potluck, invite people over to share food. I really yes. honestly think that we undervalue the simplicity of that. So that's what I'll offer. And it, for me, that's what I do. And I can't wait to start doing it again. Um, yeah. I'd love to hear Baya though. I feel like Baya is going to have some interesting to say. I don't think I want to add anything to that. One, because it's Aaron. And two, because that is beautifully, eloquently stated. I don't think it needs a more complex container than that. Study is always fugitive. It was never contained or containable. Um, so let's potluck, let's um, picnic, let's, every time we gather together, that's a form of research. Sorry, Erin, study. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie, beautiful. So we have more questions. There are more people, brave enough. Um, we've got Ivan and Anna Suya, um, but we also only have five minutes left. So um, do either of you feel like your questions are quite short and could be quite succinct it's, it's probably not i don't know in this framing <laughs> possible amisha succinct <laughs> doesn't work here <laughs> um i would like to bring your voices in so let's have both of the questions yeah. and then let's see what see you know what can be done to 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 speak to them so um ivan you're already unmuted it looks like would you like to jump in 
Uh, yeah, just a, I don't know. It's not. It's not a question actually. It is. A, it's just um, the realization that uh, the bio might be right in saying that uh, language is um, is non-human in the way we articulate the human to be, and I think the living proof of that today is that um, you guys are kind of weird in a weird way, mediums of a form of telluric language that is showing today, showing up today, um, mobilizing emotions and my heart is pounding. So it's, it's just, um, that's, that's the most uh, probably honest um, remark that I can give. It's not even a question by asking a question, I will be, I will be um, positioning myself as a self. It's just uh, an invitation to, um, to thank you both for, for, this, for the generosity of your thinking uh, and your experiences and uh, the realization that perhaps, yeah, language is something beyond symbols and um, you are mobilizing it in ways that are making my heart pound big time. So thank you very much for that. Ivan is in love. Thank you, Ivan. Um, yeah, feeling that we can break free from some of the constraints of the spoken and written word in our expressions of our humanness. Um, Anna Soya, would you like to ask your question? We, we can't hear you. I wonder if you turn off your video. Enjoying your smile so much, but if we maybe then, oh, let's let's try now. How about can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. It was my headset. So hello, Bio. Hello, Sophie. It's so great to see both of you. Oh my goodness, this conversation has been amazing. So I just want to say, uh, ask one question: Where is the space in that distance, in that space for the kebab to come down? Where in that space of, of bewilderment that we can is the Black Madonna, um, the Earth Mother, that which is essential, that which gave life. Because for me, this is the space of, of her presence and of her beauty and her demand to re re return to her throne, return to the throne in our hearts and our consciousness. And one of the ways she's showing up is Earth, re Earth is retaliation. One of the ways she's showing up is something that, a, a virus that is getting us to stand still and, and go within. So if you can address that, that would be great. My dear sister, Sophie, would you like to go first? You're muted. I can try. Okay. Thank you, Anna Soya. I, you know, my parents studied the Black Madonna and visited all of her shrines and have written books about her. So this feels like very synchronous. Uh, I, I don't pretend to know quite as much as they do. For me, the feminine is more of a morphic field, as is the masculine, as are many, all the rhizomatic million fold um, androgen other genders that flow between. They're, they're patterns that we fall into, but those patterns leak and they overlap. Um, and for me, the Black Madonna is, is, is multi-species, it is tentacular. It is Medusa's head with those snake tongues that are forking into and tasting all sorts of different time periods and geographies and um, experiences and umwelts, as Jacob von Uxel would say, sensory perceptions. So for me, the Black Madonna is inherently more than human, inherently um, multi-temporal, um, polytemporal. Um, exploding and, and invites us into that kind of, you know, I think of Kali with the many arms and the many hands dancing, holding many different instruments, having a tool for everything. So I think that, you know, we can, we can tap into her by tapping, by, by practicing a kind of kaleidoscopic empathy, pouring ourselves, knowing that this exercise will fail, but trying to pour ourselves into other modes of consciousness. Yeah. Thank mm. you. Thank you. And Anasuya, you kind of know what I'm going to say, um, but I'll say it. Uh, so the Yoruba people speak about Awonyawa, which is this understanding that power is, in a sense, occultic, right? This is why I've never been able to subscribe or align myself with a notion of power that is 
squarely and exclusively premised upon recognition, right? Or the voice or the exercising of voice. Because I know that when I enter into a room in, in back in my homelands, it's the ones that are quiet that are the most powerful. And the ones that are the most powerful and the most quiet are the, are the mothers speaking behind the uh, men that are gesticulating in the midst of the circle. Those are the ones that they call Awon Yawa or Aje, right? The English man came in and, and translated Aje as witch. And then yet another unfortunate description <laughs> or translation. But this idea of Aje is that is so beautifully articulated by Sophie already. And I love your use of the word tentacular, right? Rhizomatic, spread out, diasporic, that power cannot be contained. That the mother is matrixial and her womb is everlasting, right? It's, it's, it breeds and it births all things. And it is also the site of death. So, but to be more practical, if one can speak about the practical in those ways, how do we make space for that? I don't think of space as the emptiness between bodies, right? That needs to be filled, you know, that needs some cumulative attention. I think of space as the querying of the presence of bodies, right? As the inflection of presence, right? That presence is never fully present. Presence is always conditioned, inhabited, uh, instigated, supported by absence. This is what psychology learns to pathologize as sickness, as uh, disease or dissociation or trauma and things like that. But a different cosmology thinks of those spaces, those openings as possible invitations, not to be taken lightly, but always to be approached with risk for the new. That if we want to sit with Aje, if we want to sit with Awanyawa, if we want to touch into black joy, where blackness is not an identitarian concept, but the emergence and the murmuration of everything, even though I don't like to use the concept of everything because there's no easy umbrella concept that contains everything. <laughs> um, if we wanna sit with that power, especially in these times when the pillars that hold modernity are crumbling, then we need to go to those places of failure, right? The clue is in the darkness of it. The clue is in the spaces that we've learned to shield or push out or, in, or treat as impoverished. And this is why to speak about education again to a group of graduates last year in Pacific Graduate Institute, I, I, in the commencement address, I, I said, what if success is a disability? What can you lean into right now if success your success, the imaginaries of success are becoming complicit in supporting the Anthropocene. What does that do for us? So I feel mother is waiting for us at the end of this virus, where, the, where I don't mean the end as determination, but as the embrace of this virus in its complexity. I think mother is waiting for us at the, uh, or in the spaces of cracks, in the places of deep failure. I think mother is waiting for us in places of deep communal disability, that we need generative incapacitation if we're to really sit with this trouble. Um, yeah. Yay, that was fabulous. That's exactly how I feel, yay, yay, yay. Thank you, Bio and Sophie and whoever that was, the, the enthusiastic voice that just came in. Um, Sophie and Bio, do you have anything that you want to share um, around uh, work that you have coming up or um, programs you have coming up or ways that you want people to connect with you? Thanks, Amisha. Thanks, Bio. This has been the proper medicine, the proper pharmacon, you know, the irritant that also, you know, adaptogenically uh, ignites me back into, into liveliness. Um, uh, I have a book coming out. Um, it's called The Flowering Wand, Rewilding the Sacred Masculine. I did not choose the subtext, Rewilding the Sacred Masculine. It was supposed to be trans species magicians, rhizomatic harpists, lichenized lovers, and lunar kings heal the masculine. So 
just to put some context there, it's available for pre-order. And you can find me at Cosmogony on Instagram. You can find me at sophiestrand.substack.com. And that is how you can keep up with me. Um, yeah, let me see if I can, I'm so tech bad. So let's see if I can figure this out. There we are. Um, thank you everyone so, so much. Thank you. And Bio, anything you would like to point us in the direction of? I just feel like I'm brimming with joy, the joy of actually being in conversation with everyone here, with your faces, your smiles, um, and with you, Amisha, but most especially with Sophie, with Sophie Strand. And so I have no desire to actually share any detail about me. I just want to say, go check out Sophie Strand and look forward to her book that is coming out. Sophie is one of the most powerful elocutors of our time and of this paradigm that is moving. Get to know her work, be dazzled by her speech and her power. And yes, I celebrate you, my sister. Yes. The flourishing is mutual, as Robin Walkimer says, and it flows right back to you. Thank you for being part of the compost heap that made me who I am. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. So. You can um, find Sophie's website, sophiestrand.com, and, um, and you can find bio at bioacomalafe.net. And um, thank you to each one of you for being here. And um, there is an, a note that if anybody wants to be part of the closing carnival of the Reimagining Education Conference, that you can share music, poetry, clowning, juggling, storytelling, dances, embodiment practices, prayers, rituals, anything that you want to. And there's a form in the chat box that you can fill in um, if you want to be part of that. And thank you all so much for being here. And I, I can say that we have all really been very moved by this connection that you have, Bio and Sophie, and, and to hear you two um, dialogue together um, as we explore this topic has has really been a very beautiful experience for all of us and so thank you very much for that and um, and you can find the podcast at all that we are dot org thank you thank you all hey sorry to jump in i just wanted to share that we have a cafe world in 10 minutes here if you want to stay to share around this session or others, you can stay around. Thank you so much. And Erin Dunford is often a twerking session. Please. Uh... <laughs> Bio, you are offering the tweaking, twerking session. That's you. Tweaking and twerking. Exactly. Look, Adrian is Kim, waiting. Kim, She's been waiting for years to see you. Twerking on the speed dating. Yeah, twerking, twerking and speed dating. <laughs> yeah, yo. Brother. Sophie, love you, sister. You. Bye. Hi, guys. Thank Amisha, you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hi, Sophie. Thank you for everything. Here for you. Amisha, yeah, yeah, I'll make you the host. Amisha, you were phenomenal. Thank you so much for this the wonderful insights and questions you asked. It's fabulous. How soon can we get the replay? Um, well, so I don't know, but thank you. I mean, I definitely felt like um, a third wheel <laughs> in, in, a, in a conversation. That's that inevitable with those two minds. Yeah, That's inevitable. Have, but you, so you held your own, sis. You held your own. <laughs> thank you for saying that. Um, I So the podcast, like the, the voice recording uh, won't be a, around till April because we're, we're just in a season break at the moment. Um, but I don't know. Uh, maybe Daniel or someone can step in and share like when the <clears throat> recordings are available within the reimagining education. I, I imagine the video is going to be somewhere. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I can jump in with that. Amazing. We, Thank you. Yes, we will send the information on the email, and we are hoping to have all the recordings by next week on the Zoom. We have a team right. now of volunteers that will make some editing. So we hope to have this on YouTube, for example, right. and to have it like to share it to others too. So let's see that, but we'll have like recordings from Zoom next week on your email. Amazing. Thank you. That's wonderful. I'm so excited I know, about this I, whole day. I know, I know I'm going to have to go and sit in a tree and listen to this conversation again. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah.